Guess what? The most exciting thing that's happened to us in years is not even the AIA. It's the two-year study that we've engaged the University of Alaska in to do what NIST would not do. And that is a real computer dynamic analysis with open architecture, open input data. And one of the top forensic structural engineers in the country, the department chairman of the University of Alaska at Fairbanks, who's conducting this study on our behalf for our supporters who are funding this incredible piece of work, is Professor Leroy Halsey, who's with us today. Professor Halsey. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Quite a experience seeing white snow here in the East Coast. It's not something I prepared myself for when I brought, came here. So this afternoon, I just wanted to take a moment and share with you uh, fairly quickly some of the stuff that we're doing. And so... Um, Down arrow. Down on, on your computer? Yeah. Okay. So a uh, little bit of history. Uh, just as a re, uh, reply of everything that we've been seeing today, on September 11, 2001, as we all know, uh, WTC-7 endured fires for almost seven hours from the time of the collapse of the North World Trade Center Tower, WTC-1, uh, at 10.28, or 10.28.22 a.m. until 5.20 in the afternoon, uh, WTC-7 collapsed. What I'm reading to you is a document that was written by the NIST report. And so they go on to say that the heat from the uncontrolled fires caused steel floor beams and girders to thermally expand, get bigger than they were, leading to a chain of events that caused key structural columns to fail, or a column to fail, that was column 79 actually. The failure of this structural column then initiated a fire-induced progressive collapse of the entire building. So here in a moment, I'm going to kind of share with you a few things that we've learned. So we began as an objective of this work to evaluate the findings for the collapse presented by NIST. What, and I was also uh, intending to take a look at what did not cause collapse. We can't necessarily determine what might have brought the building down, but we can certainly evaluate what did not. Examine progressive collapse mechanisms, which we're in the process of starting to do at, at this at this time, we started about a week ago, provide a summary of findings and conclusions of our work. Today's presentation will attempt to answer the question, did WTC-7's collapse, was it caused by fire? And then I'll provide a small timeline of what, when we expect to kind of complete our work. So this is kind of a snapshot of what WTC-7, what it looked like in comparison to uh, the Twin Towers, Another look at it and the, and the um, parts of the plane that came off uh, when it collided with the uh, trade towers. And here's uh, WTC-7, our work, and where it com uh, lands with respect to the rest of the structure. Just a little bit of history. The construction for WTC-7 started in 1983. It was completed in 1987, four years later. The height to roof is, was 610 feet. Floors were set 47 floors. Uh, the floor area was about 10, 2 million square feet per floor. Not a small structure. 32 elevators in this building. The architect was Emory Roth and Sons, and the uh, structural engineer was Erwin Cantor. This is important because when you do an investigation, you've got to know what codes you la land within. And I was hoping when we got started that I was able to get the structural calculations and plans. That has not been the case. Uh, they are not making them available to the public. A little bit about the building uh, and why it's important to me to know who was in the building. Uh, so Smith Barney was on floors 13 and 18 through 46. 
IRS was on floors 24 and 25, U.S. Secret Service on floor 9 and 10. And, but you'll see here with the red, which is uh, one of our focus areas, floor 13, was primarily securities, banking, uh, financial institutions. What I'm trying to do here is get an understanding of what may have been the combustibles on those floors. The UF, UAF, which is the university that I'm at, uh, we have just chosen to look at these topics, kind of give you a snapshot of what we're doing. We're looking at the material properties that actually went into that building. In other words, what it was constructed of, which has a merit on how it responds to fire, how it expands, and how vulnerable it might be to flame. We're looking at the diaphragm behavior, which is basically the floor slab, how it moves, how stiff is it with respect to the rest of the structure. We're looking at what, what I call point of zero movement, which uh, I find it is not well understood in the industry. Basically, there's a point on that floor system, floor to floor, to floor where if you heat it up, it's going to move with respect to it. As an example, if I, hold, if I hold a piece of steel and I just hold it on one end and I heat it up, it's going to expand with, with respect to where I'm holding it. If I hold it on the other end, it's going to expand with respect to that. There's a point in this structure where it, it moves with respect to that point. We're looking at the concrete steel floor interaction. And basically, when I use the word composite or non-composite or partially composite, I mean that that floor is connected to the floor beams that are holding it up. You can connect it by putting what we call um, shear connectors on it, which is steel studs like bolts welded to the top flange of that, and then it, concrete is poured with respect to holding that whole thing together. So when I use the word composite, that's what that means. If we didn't have shear connectors, it would be non-composite. In other words, the slab could actually move with respect to the top flange. Equivalent concrete deck versus fluted concrete uh, floor slab with welded wire fabric is something that I looked at to try to get an, an equivalent behavior because the way that is constructed, it it's behaves differently in one direct, in a direction perpendicular to the framing uh, versus the other direction. It's just the way that the stay-in-place steel forms were actually put on this building. Um, substructuring, I actually substructure this thing to save computer time. I won't go through the details of it, but basically what we're doing is taking this highly complex thing, breaking it down into simple pieces that has the same, same behavior as if I didn't do that, just to be able to get an understanding of how it behaves quickly. We're looking at the, the nonlinear behavior of how the beams and girders and the beams to uh, to the columns and the, be and the girders to the columns actually work together. Uh, we're looking at the heat transfer between under uh, on the drop ceiling, if whether there, that airspace actually helped it, uh, fireproofing and no fireproofing, and then uh, so all of those are considered as part of this. The NIST report basically said, okay, this building has been impacted by the debris coming from the towers. That produced debris that went through the windows, created a fire, and then structural damage was also felt when it came through there. They used three computer programs, fire dynamic analysis to simulate the fires on that building. They also looked at structural interface and structural response due to those fires by using ANSYS, which is a well-known finite element program. They also looked at initial structural response and probable collapse using LS Dyna, which is a extremely well-known program as well. So we looked at the, the topics uh, that uh, were material behavior, properties, zero, so I've already gone through that, I won't go through it again. Wait a minute, I'm going in the wrong direction, apologize for that. So here's the NIST discussion points. I just want to kind of quickly, so this is a side view of the building. Uh, floor 13 is highlighted there, that's kind of where we were looking at the, the building and floor 12 and 13. Down below, you'll see a plan view. You'll see that this building is not um, symmetrical. That's pretty significant. Not only is it not symmetrical, it's not even structurally the same from one side to the other. So that's pretty significant. So the NIST conclusions for initial failure was, NIST argues that, one, the absence of girder shear studs 
would have been provided lateral restraint and the one-sided lateral support to the girder provided by the northeast corner floor beams for column 79. So let me go back for just a moment and kind of give you an idea. The northeast corner would be the upper right corner as you're looking at that plan view down at the bottom near D. So you should see A, B, well it's A, B, C, D, but D's on the upper right. So that's kind of where we're at with respect to this. Failure of a girder column connections were caused primarily due to thermal expansion of large span lengths of the northeast floor beams. Uh, they also said the uh, fire-induced weakening of the critical columns was not a factor. Temperature column 79 was actually below 200 degrees C, so it didn't weaken it and it didn't produce the failure. Movement along the beam axis was caused by sagging, and they also said that lateral displacement of the girder framing into column 79 was a result of thermal expansion of the beams framing into that girder. This is kind of what they basically said. Uh, because they had moved so much, they lost so, uh, support, which produced the lateral brace of that column uh, <clears throat> at uh, 12 and 13. And so you'll see in the red there, that's lateral support of the column. And uh, what happens with the column is that if you don't have enough lateral support, it's extremely uh, vulnerable to uh, vertical load, the lo load of the member weight of the entire building. And so it is, becomes vulnerable and it can, it can buckle and it's not returnable when that happens. So that's what they said happened. What we discovered when we started studying this is that they, in the, in the blue section there, you see they actually approximated the connections, the floor to beam, the beam to girder, uh, and they attempted to do that. But everything to the left, and that's only a part of this floor system, uh, you remember that this is a, a fairly wide floor system. Everything to the left that's not in blue, they did not do that. They just approximated it by using a pin uh, or a fixed end, which basically uh, is a stiffer system. I don't know why they did that, but they did. So what I want to share with you now is a little bit about what that building looks like when it falls and what their model looks like on the right. And so ask yourself if that represents the same thing to you. Yet, you know, that's their approximation of what happened. This is another view of that simulated model of theirs, noting that one side of the building is coming down faster than the other, which means it's more flexible, less stiff. And here internally is how it's failing, which gives you another snapshot of this whole thing. Again, this is turning a look in the other side, but one side of this is coming down, the other side is, is not coming down the way it did, okay? So our approach is basically this. We have, we have two programs that we're using to model it. We're using a, I'm using a quality control program in which I have two PhD students, two researchers working with me. I'm using a program called Abacus, which is a highly sophisticated final program. Gives you the ability to really micro-evaluate uh, and detail the, the, what's going on with this system. Uh, so we looked at uh, all the connections. We looked at uh, whether the floor system was connected uh, with the shear, reinforce, shear studs or not shear studs. We also uh, looked at uh, floors 12 and 13 for thermal expansion, and, and I used another computer program, SAP 2000, to compare that. Fire and NIST fire models, we used them instead of uh, Looking at uh, a lot of the other options, we did create another fire model which was conservative and we, we did that using uh, a computer program and we then conducted heat transfer through the floor systems with a, another program called SolidWorks. Our research continued with uh, steel framing connections. We looked at all that, substructure frames. Heat transfer was studied for uh, looking at floor tile over the concrete floor, looking at the floor system, airspace between the drop ceiling and the floor. Uh, we looked at all of those. We looked at fire protection, no fire protection. I'm just saying, here's what we did. We looked at a worst case scenario and a best case scenario. That's what was really uh, the bottom line of what we're doing, to try to evaluate what may have happened here. Uh, we looked at equivalent uh, concrete conductivity for all of the things in, within that floor system. We also, in order to try to an answer the question properly, we um, looked at the aggregate type that was put in the concrete and that looked like it was dolomite and that affects uh, the thermal expansion of the floor system. 
So this is kind of, this is out of the NIST report. This represents uh, how the girder at uh, column 79 was connected. And um, the NIST report did not show that there were any bearing stiffeners or actually were. It, this represents what actually went on. What you see on your left is actually the abacus model of that system. And so we, here's a sample of how we actually did all those connections. And, and we took every system, and that's kind of a representation of what it looks like. SAP is uh, the program we use for bracing and framing. Uh, this is the NIST fires. We simulated them. We got temperature distribution. This is our abacus model that we actually used for on floor 12s and 13. On the right, uh, on floor 13, uh, you'll see these colors. The blue is the, is the least amount of horizontal movement. Uh, well, actually, blue is the absolute least amount of movement. Uh, to the right, you see the most. That's red. The red is about 6.84 inches that it moved. Uh, this is another picture of that, so it actually moved to the right. Uh, the point that's absolutely important here is everything in our model moved to the right. In, in reality, uh, what NIST said, it moved to the left. And so... Uh, NIST said it went from five and a half inches or 6.2 inches uh, to the left. Ours said it 1.85 to 1.92 inches to the right. The importance of that is it couldn't have show, pushed off of that uh, base of, of, of that support and it uh, wouldn't have lost lateral support. Okay, so I'm going in the wrong direction again. I apologize. I'm about to finish. So if you take a look at floor 13 here and you take a look at... Uh, how NIST modeled it, uh, the exterior wall was treated as an infinite system and it all moved to the left. That's not true. What actually happens is the exterior is less stiff than everything to the left. And so it actually moved to the right. And so the pictures that I've shown you is what actually happened based on our model in red. NIST's model is on, uh, on, on and the NIST model is on, uh, in, in the blue. This is kind of a comparative set of studies, and I know I'm over, but just give me one second if you don't mind. So this is kind of a comparison of what, what have we've done. The floor framing steel connections, we modeled as springs. NIST uh, did only a partial modeling of that. Exterior steel framing connections were included in our, our work. NIST did not. Greater to calm stiffener plates were actually included because they were built that way. NIST did not. Floors composite with the beams and not girders. We looked at it, and NIST did. Floors composite with beams and girders, uh, they, we looked at it, they did not. Thermal expansion of the concrete deck, we looked at that, they did not. Thermal conductivity and expansion of the material properties such as the concrete, we looked at it, they did not. So they have a thermal expansion movement of um, five and a half inches in, that, in 2012, they modified that to be 6.25 inches because there, apparently there was some doubt whether that would have actually caused the failure. I don't know how, why they would have uh, all of a sudden found that they needed 7, uh, 0.75 more inches. Uh, so uh, UAF then has based all of our work on NIST column temperatures, and column 79 did not buckle uh, under gravity loading. So I'm going to skip the conclusions and what's next. I just want to share with you that our conclusion is that did building 7 collapse under fire? We, we did not find that that was the case. We can't find any justification that could come could have come down by fire. So that contradicts the findings by the NIST report. Uh, and we're in the process right now of looking at uh, progressive collapses. We're taking out the columns. We're now taking out the columns at floor eight. What I found is that quite interesting, which is no big surprise. The building is not coming that straight down. It's actually leaning to the west as it's coming down. So remember, the building is not symmetrical, nor is it built even to have symmetrical behavior. It's actually built stiffer on one side than it is on the other. So it's going to have to be forced to come straight down. Even a symmetrical structure, for God's sake, isn't built perfectly. So nothing is ever going to come straight down unless you force it to do that. Anyway, that's where I'm at. Thank you. Thank you, Leroy. We are very grateful for all the work that you're doing up in Alaska.